Sure. Okay, welcome back everyone uh, for the last talk of our workshop. So last but not least, of course, Ilias Diakonikolas is going to tell us about recent developments in supervised learning with benign noise. Take it away, Ilias. All right, so uh, I hope you can hear me. So thanks to Seb, Adam, and all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, a recent progress on robust supervised learning in high dimensions. Uh, with a focus on something that is called uh, benign noise. So I'm going to clarify what this means uh, soon. So at the high level, I want to address you know, this generic question. So we want to develop efficient algorithms for uh, supervised learning in high dimensions when we cannot trust, uh, at least not fully, the data that we have. So this is a you know ancient problem. So it's coming from statistics before computer science existed. So the classical motivation in statistics is something that's called model misspecification. So the model that you assume that generates the data, your statistical model is not gonna be exact. It's gonna be at best approximate. So if you design an algorithm for the algorithm to be potentially useful, it needs to be robust from some kind of deviation from the assumptions that you made. So uh, like in terms of practical motivations, there is something that's called data poisoning. Uh, so, th so this is um, a phenomenon that appears in machine learning systems. So it's a general weakness, a general vulnerability of machine learning systems. So it arises when we have um, uh, data fed into our system that we cannot fully trust. For example, let's say we have a system, the data is gonna be collected from various users and some of these users are malicious. So they cannot fake data, for example, give us noisy labels to manipulate uh, the system. So this is a big problem in recommendation systems like Amazon. And more generally, whenever we want to make decisions using crowdsource data, we have to be careful. Uh, okay, now let's uh, switch gears. Uh, and uh, formally define uh, the setting. So this is gonna be a statistical learning setting. And um, I'm gonna clarify quite soon what, what I mean by robustness in this talk. So the model is gonna be the PAC model. So the standard model for binary classification. So what's the setup? So there is a, a known class of functions, this calligraphic C. So this class is assumed, uh, at least in the noiseless case, to contain the function we're trying to learn. Uh, this is the target function. And what we observe, so what's the input? So the input is a set of labeled examples, X, Y. So these examples are drawn from some distribution D. Okay, so X is uh, the example, Y is the binary label of the example X. Now the distribution uh, of examples, so those are these D sub X in the slide, is fixed, but in general, it can be anything. And the learner needs to work for any distribution, that's important. So this is what the term distribution independent learning means. So this was the original definition of pack learning by Valiant in the early uh, 80s. So there is also the distribution specific setting where we have some a priori structural assumptions on the data distribution. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in the second part of the talk. Now the label, uh, the Y corresponding to example X uh, is equal to F of X where F is the target function in the class C and the goal is to find the hypothesis with small error. So in particular, this, um, this probability that H of X is not equal to Y, I'm gonna call that misclassification error, right? Now, this version of the PAC model is called the realizable PAC model. And the reason for that name is because we are assuming that all the examples uh, are consistent with uh, the target function, the label co correctly. Uh, now let's see what pack learning with Massar noise is. So Massar noise model is gonna be uh, the, uh, the main noise model, the main benign noise model we'll focus on this talk. So the setup is the same as before, but now uh, the label of each example is flipped with some small probability. So this is this eta of X that you see in purple. Now this probability can depend on the example X in general, it is unknown to the learner. So we don't know what eta of x is for every x. The learning algorithm doesn't know this function. Uh, it function it can be chosen adversarially. And the only assumption we're making in this Massar model is that uh, this function eta of x is bounded. So there is some parameter eta, which is less than half, uh, which we may or may not know. We don't need to know it. Uh, such that eta of x is gonna be at most eta for every x. And the goal is the same, okay? We want to find a hypothesis it minimizes the classification error. All right, so let me compare this model, this Massar model with uh, some other well-studied noise models. So basically representing two different extremes. 
So first of all, there is this uh, random classification noise model. Uh, so this is a simpler model where uh, every label is going to be flipped with probability in independently. Okay, the independence is important. So, okay, with probability exactly equal to eta. Okay, so this is clearly a special case of Massar. And the second, more challenging model is the one, uh, it's called agnostic. And in this model, an adversary can um, arbitrarily flip an arbitrary eta fraction of the labels. At least that's the intuitive definition. The real definition is what you see in the slide. Now, the Massar model lies in between the two. And the, the point is that uh, it is a model where, at least to some extent, there is a sweet spot between what um, uh, sort of uh, we can do efficiently and at the same time having a realistic model. So that's going to be the point of, of um, the first part of the talk. So again, the first part of the talk is going to be about understanding the possibilities and the limits of learning with Massar noise without distributional assumptions. And the second part of the talk will explain that we can actually do much better when we do have some kind of assumptions about the underlying distribution. Hey, right? Elias, um, yeah. sorry for the um, slightly in the weeds question, but how is there a way to compare Massart noise with, say, you know, this probabilistic concept or p-concept noise, where you have, you know, you could you have the prob you have the you know y is, a, is still a boolean label, but the probability that y is equal to one conditioned on x is equal to it's like mean zero noise, you know. Right. So, so is this model that you're referring to something that's that's uh, sort of um, uh, defined for binary classification as well, or is it for real valued? Um, I think the original model is for binary classification because the label Y is always Boolean, but there's some real, the conditional mean function is real valued. So, you know, the probability that Y equals one is equal to, you know, some condition on X is equal to some real valued function of X. So if it's 0 0.99, then probably Y is going to take the value one. It's a, but, you know, so you could think of it as sort of mean zero noise because, because you know what the conditional mean function is. I see. So do we know how to learn how spaces in this model? Well, um, <clears throat> depends on what the conditional mean function is. I see. Okay, so let's take this offline. I'm not sure how it's compared to how Massar compares to this uh, to this model, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's clearly known, okay? Just not known to me because I haven't worked in this model. All okay, right, so sorry for the kind of in the weeds. No, 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 no problem. That's a good question. All right, so I think that was a good actual time for the question. So now let's uh, move on to uh, part one. So distribution independent part learning with Massar noise. So really the, the sort of slightly technical part of the talk is gonna be about half spaces and then we're gonna talk about more general concepts uh, uh, at a high level. Uh, so the sort of motivation for looking at distribution independent learning is um, exactly that. So like uh, recently, you know, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work on algorithmic high dimensional uh, robust statistics. So this is a learning both supervised and unsupervised with adversarial corruption. Let's say you assume that a constant fraction of your data is uh, arbitrary uh, in some sense. Now, all the algorithmic results that have been developed in that, in that domain, they need to make some um, assumptions on the clean data. For example, that the clean data comes from a well-behaved distribution like a Gaussian or log concave or something like that, or a distribution of whose moments you have control of. So, and uh, these types of problems, especially for the unsupervised learning set, they become hard uh, very fast when you have uh, arbitrary distributions. Uh, so the motivation uh, here, at least in the, in the restricted sort of binary classification setting, uh, whether we can actually get something reasonable, something algorithmic uh, for natural classes of functions without making any distributional assumptions. All right, so conceptually, we're gonna see that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, this is possible at least to some degree. So it is possible to get uh, 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 algorithms with some non-trivial guarantees. And the main result of part one of the talk that uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how the proof works uh, is joint work with um, uh, Christos Jamos, who is at Madison and the famous Gulakis, who is now in Germany at MPI. He was my postdoc when we were working on this. Uh, the result is the first polynomial time algorithm for learning half spaces in this model, uh, other no distribution of assumptions. So let me uh, clarify what every term means here. So what are half spaces? So again, this talk is not for experts, so I have to define objects that are known to some of you. So half spaces are Boolean functions uh, whose two classes uh, have a linear separator. So this means that there is a hyperplane separating the positive examples from the negative examples. 
So a hash space can be expressed in this form, as you see in this box. So it's a sign of an affine function. So W is called the weight vector. So this is the normal vector to the separating hyperplane. And theta is called the threshold. So throughout this talk, I will assume that theta is zero. Uh, so this is without loss of generality for the distribution independent setting. And now these functions are everywhere and have been extensively, extensively studied in machine learning. Uh, all right, so they have many names, they have been studied since the perceptron algorithm since the 50s. Uh, now, how hard is it to learn half spaces in all these different noise models? So there are two questions to ask. Question number one, how many samples do you need? So this is very well understood. Uh, so sample complexity is never a problem. So polynomial in many samples in the dimension and epsilon are always enough to achieve the optimal error. On the other hand, computational complexity can, uh, uh, can differ a lot based on the model. So if there is no noise in the realizable model, the problem is easy. So it's just um, boils down to linear programming. When you have random classification noise, so this is a simpler model where the noise is independent and uniform, uh, it's, it's challenging uh, to, to say something, but uh, the problem is still solvable in polynomial time. There is this very nice paper by Blum, Fries, Kanan, and Vempala in the 90s that does that. Uh, on the other hand, so the under end of the spectrum for the agnostic model, uh, even weak learning is hard. So again, this is in the distribution independent setting. You cannot even get error better than half if uh, the optimum is very close to zero. And what is sort of has been unclear until recently is what happens with Massar noise. Okay, so for this intermediate model, we didn't have an answer until last year. Um, so in fact, even for very special cases of this problem, so uh, even for let's say, ORs of Boolean variables, uh, the problem has been open. It has been, uh, it has been uh, studied for a while, mostly with questions. We didn't have any answers. Uh, so uh, like the, even the following very basic question was, uh, was open. So even if we, we're given some examples from uh, uh, corrupted examples from, uh, from a disjunction, an OR of Boolean variables and the eta, the upper bound of the Massar noise is 1%. We didn't even know how to get 49%. So like slightly uh, non-trivial. And uh, so basically that's the summary of the distribution free setting prior to the work I'm going to, to describe. Uh, and I should say very briefly that if we make very strong distribution assumptions about the inputs, for example, let's say that the X's are uniform over the sphere, then there, have, there has been progress in the past five years. And I'm gonna talk about this progress in the second part of the talk. All right, so here's the main result of the first part of the talk. So we give an efficient algorithm for learning how spaces with Massar noise. Uh, and the error of the algorithm is eta plus epsilon. Eta is the upper bound on the noise rates. Uh, the running time is gonna be polynomial in the dimension in one over the accuracy. So this is the excess error over eta. And this parameter B, and this B is just the bit complexity of the examples. Uh, so we're assuming we're you know, observing real valued uh, uh, points. Uh, all right, so before I give you an idea of, about how this algorithm works, so let me make a few short remarks. So first of all, the algorithm I'm going to describe is not proper. So this means it does not output a half space. Uh, instead, it outputs something more complicated, which is a decision list over half spaces, and we're gonna see why. Second, the error we get is not optimal. The error we get, it, the error we get is eta plus epsilon as opposed to opt plus epsilon. Now, what is this quantity opt? Opt is the best possible error we can achieve by any half space. And uh, it's not difficult to see that for this model it's gonna be the expected value over x of eta of x. Eta of x is our noise value function. Uh, and of course, since eta of x is at most eta point wise, opt is at most eta. But of course, uh, opt could be much uh, smaller. So ideally, we would like to be competitive with opt, but we don't know how to. And I'm going to explain why um, towards the end of the first part of the talk. Uh, all right. So now let me give you some intuition. First of all, are there any questions about the, the statement before I move to explain stuff? So if not, let me move on. All right. So some intuition about the problem. So this slide is, is mostly pedagogical. So most of these things should be known to you if you work in machine learning, but if you, if you don't, then you, know, you may uh, sort of, you know, they may be useful. Uh, so to make things simple, I will assume for this slide that the data is well separated. So this means that all the examples 
that we observe have distance at least gamma from the separating hyperplane. So you can see this picture that there is this slab of, um, of width gamma around the true separator, which is defined by W star, and this slab is empty. Now this parameter gamma is known as the margin. Okay, and the optimization here is assumed to sort of uh, take place over the unit ball. All right, so let's think how we would solve the problem in this case. So first of all, without noise. So uh, in general, what we would like to solve is the, the empirical risk minimizer. So just take the expectation of the zero one loss. So in this case, the objective function we want to, to minimize is this one, this L zero one. So what does it say? It says that if y and w dot x, where w is the weight vector you're optimizing over, have the same sign, then I don't pay anything in cost, in loss, and otherwise I pay something. So in reality, basically this is what's happening. I take the function of minus y w dot x and I apply a step function, so this blue function. Uh, now we cannot just directly solve that, it's a non-convex problem. Uh, so the first trick in the book is to use convex surrogates. And indeed, this is something that works um, in the noiseless case. In fact, uh, this is what perceptron is about. So perceptron is basically stochastic gradient descent on a specific convex surrogate. And the specific convex surrogate that we use that we replace the zero one loss by is the ReLU function. Okay, so this is the ReLU. So literally, the perceptron algorithm is SGD on this loss function. This is convex, so we can optimize it. Uh, all right, so uh, again, to see that this works, note that uh, the vector W correctly classifies X if and only if the label Y has the same sign as the inner product W dot X. Okay, so by the definition of this ReLU function, we suffer positive loss for incorrectly classified points and zero loss for correctly classified points. All right, now let's see what we do for random classification noise. So, uh, so again, random classification noise means um, independent, uh, uh, independent flips of the labels and the noise is uniform and eta is the probability of misclassification. So in this case, we're going to correct slightly the ReLU function and this works. Uh, of course, we cannot use the ReLU anymore as it is. It's very easy to see, but uh, uh, because we have a very specific noise model, we know the expected effect of the noise exactly, point-wise. For every x, we know exactly the probability of misclassification. Uh, so the correction we apply is that instead of using the instead of using the ReLU function, we use something that's called the um, um, leaky ReLU. So this is uh, this function, and this leakage parameter lambda, which corresponds to this uh, slope of the negative part, uh, it's uh, basically roughly set to eta where eta now is, is the upper bounds on the, on the uh, where eta is, is, uh, is uh, the flipping probability for random classification noise. So I'm not going to explain why this works in detail, but roughly speaking, this leakage parameter is needed to account for the fact that the label that we observe, the y is not always correct. It's incorrect with probability exactly equal to eta. And intuitively this, lo this loss function, what it does is it penalizes points which are misclassified proportional to the distance from the corresponding hyperplane while it rewards points that are correctly classified at a slightly smaller rate uh, as without uh, compared to, to, to sort of the, the real case. So long story short, in both these cases, in both the case of uh, no noise and the case of random classification noise, there exists uh, a convex surrogate L uh, that is actually minimized at W star. It's minimized at the optimal weight vector. We can just solve this convex, convex optimization problem by gradient descent and uh, get the answer. All right, so let's, uh, uh, let's uh, 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 go to, to, uh, to the Massar noise case. So let's do something new. So it's natural to ask if something similar can be done for the Massar noise case. So unfortunately, this turns out to be impossible. Specifically, we show that no convex surrogate works with Massar noise. And this means that for any convex surrogate, there exists an instance where the optimal solution of this surrogate will have misclassification error 50%. So the convex surrogate approach, at least superficially, seems completely useless. And of course, the next question is, is it at all useful? Can we use it uh, to any extent? And we show that uh, it is in fact useful, but in a slightly different way. So in particular, 
if we consider the same optimization problem as in the random classification noise case, so the same convex surrogates, um, so the leaky relu with leakage parameter approximately equal to eta, where now eta is going to be the upper bound of the Massar noise rates. And then we take the optimal solution W hat. So this is this red uh, line in the picture. Then we prove the following lemma that uh, uh, there exists uh, some threshold T with the following property that if we look at this region RT, so this is the set of points uh, whose distance from the separating hyperplane is large, is at least T, then we have two properties for this region. First of all, uh, this region has non-trivial probability mass. So its probability under the distribution is going to be at least epsilon times gamma. Gamma is the margin. Epsilon is the excess error we're going to get. And the error of W hat in this region, okay, not overall, within this region is small. It's going to be at most eta plus epsilon. So that's like the sort of main structural uh, lemma. Uh, okay, so what we, ha what we have so far, so even though convex surrogates do not work on the entire domain, there exists a convex surrogate that gives a good hypothesis on an unknown subset S of the domain. So this subset has a specific shape. It is the region outside the fat hyperplane. So the algorithm goes as follows. So, that, uh, so we just uh, use the classifier given by this convex surrogate on this subset S. Okay, uh, and we iterate it on the complement. Okay, and um, uh, since the probability mass of this set is not too small, after a polynomial number of iterations, uh, we have uh, an accurate classifier on the entire domain. Okay, and maybe one point I didn't emphasize enough is that even though this set S is, is unknown, because it basically amounts to searching in a given direction, it's a one dimensional problem, we can literally brute force it, okay, and find such a region. All right, so this concludes the overview of this algorithm for the case of large margin. Are there any questions so far? All right, so let me move on. So I'm not gonna go into the proof of this, but basically I want to convince you that it's short. So basically to prove the structural lemma, we have two individual lemmas and each one of these lemmas actually fits uh, in a slide, okay? That's it in terms of the proof. Now let me move on to the general case, okay? So far we have described an algorithm under the large margin uh, assumption. So in the general case, the margin could be really small. It would be exponentially small in the dimension or even zero. So how do we handle the general case? Um, so the idea is to reduce it to the large margin case. Uh, to do that, we can use techniques from prior work so this is not done in a black box manner, but you know, it can be done. So a way to do this um, is uh, with a technique um, from a paper by Danaga and Vipala. So here is the key lemma from uh, their work. So I'm gonna spare you from the formal details. The idea is that um, we can use a pre-processing routine to slightly modify the data distribution and guarantee a weak margin property. So in particular, this means that after we do this pre-processing, uh, there's going to be an explicit margin parameter, let's call it sigma, which is not going to be too small. It's going to be inverse polynomial in the dimension and the big complexity, such that if you take any hyperplane, it's going to have at least um, a non-trivial uh, amount of mass uh, uh, at distance at least sigma uh, from it. Okay, so we can actually use that and get an algorithm for the general case. Now, if we actually do that, if we use this tool from Danagar and Pala, which is what we did in the first paper with Christos and uh, Themis, we actually get a sample complexity that is um, uh, scales polynomial, not only with the dimension, but also with the bit complexity of the examples, which in general is not something that we want. Uh, for example, if the examples have too many bits. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we know that if we don't care about running time, we don't need any dependence on being the sample complexity. Uh, and so let me close this section by mentioning that in very recent work with uh, uh, Christos and Daniel Kane, we have been able to devise a different reduction of the general case to the margin case that removes completely this, this beta dependence from the sample complexity. Uh, all right, so that concludes sort of this, uh, uh, this part. So let me uh, uh, close the discussion about half spaces in the distribution independent setting with some very recent follow-up work. So uh, 
Uh, recall that the algorithm I just described uh, is not proper. It doesn't output a hash space hypothesis. It turns out that this is not inherent. So building on these ideas, uh, a very nice paper by Chen, uh, Kohler, Moitra, and Yao, they recently gave a proper learning algorithm for the same problem, achieving the same error guarantee of eta plus epsilon. Moreover, uh, the same paper by observing a connection to the correlational statistical query model showed that if you want to do exact learning, if you want to get error opt, uh, you need super polynomial time in the statistical query model. So this is a broad family of algorithms um, that uh, you know, are basically, you know, uh, almost all we know uh, um, in, in the uh, path learning of Boolean function sharing. All right, so from this latter result, from this harder result, we know that exact learning is hard. So a natural question is, how about approximate learning? For example, what if you want to do O of opt error or some function of opt? Uh, more recently in a paper with, uh, with Daniel Kane, we were able to show a strong statistical query lower bound in this setting, which basically rules out any constant factor approximation to opt or even any polynomial factor approximation. So if you want to have an error of O of opt to the constant, let's say this constant could be very close to zero, one over 1000, this is actually something that requires super polynomial time in the SQ model. Uh, so to summarize, so we have described an algorithm for this setting for half spaces that achieves error eta plus epsilon, okay? Where eta is an upper bound on uh, the noise rates. And we have some hardened results. So basically the status of the problem is this, we have this line which basically represents the error of classifiers. So a half is the error of the opt of the sort of trivial classifier. Opt is the best thing we can achieve. So eta is uh, an upper bound we can achieve by this algorithm. So this is sort of the limit of current algorithms as far as we know. Uh, from the very recent hardness result, we know that basically all of opt error or even poly opt error is not achievable in polynomial time for SQ algorithms. Well, there's a region here where uh, we don't know the answer. So really the main open question is that, uh, is whether there is a polynomial time algorithm that achieves misclassification error that's like any function of opt. It's actually any relative approximation. So let's say G of opt where G goes to zero with opt. Okay, so this is a challenging problem that I would like to see resolved. So still, you know, the situation is a little bit disappointing because constant factors are not impossible and polynomial factors are impossible, but still something better than eta uh, could be uh, achievable. And I do think that um, something better should be possible. All right, so this is the end of the story regarding half spaces. I Ilias, Ilias, yeah. I have a question. Just to clarify in the SQ lower bound, is the value of up exponentially small? So uh, what do you mean by exponentially small? We can get this to be basically anything that, uh, it can be uh, exponentially small in what parameter? In the dimension, let's say. No, no, no. In fact, in fact um, if opt is inverse polynomial in the dimension, the problem is solvable. I see. Okay, even in the agnostic model. So imagine that opt is a very small constant. Let's say, let's say eta is some constant, okay? Eta is um, one third and opt could be eta to the hundred, okay? So then we don't know how to improve on eta. Okay, I so we could, I get we it. Put, okay, so yeah, opt cannot be really small. If opt is really small as a function of the dimension, then, uh, then uh, the problem is easy. Uh, I think that's not quite true. I mean, our uh, lower bound does not rule out algorithms that get like one in log opt or something. Sure, sure, sure. But in any case, like the point, yeah, we cannot really rule out the difference between eta to the hundred and eta. But in any case, in this in this construction, the opt is not too small. Okay, it's not an it's not it's it's bigger than uh, it can be maybe one over log dimension, but uh, but not one over poly dimension. Okay, so, uh, so it is true that there is still some gap in our understanding. For example, if someone asks us, is there an algorithm that achieves error eta over two if the optimum is um, eta over a thousand? We don't know that, we don't, it might exist. The gap that we establish in that reduction is not close to eta, it's somewhere else, but it still can be made dimension independent. All right, so that's what I had to say about this uh, uh, about this part. So. Uh, let me move on. So, okay, so this is the end of the story about half spaces.
Okay, and the next question to ask is, what can we say for other families of functions? In some sense, the algorithm that I described at the high level is close to a boosting algorithm. Uh, so, and you know, and this sort of motivates looking at boosting algorithms in this setting. So, uh, so let me give you the world's shortest introduction to boosting. So what's a boosting algorithm? It's a method, it's a technique that combines the outputs of um, learning algorithms that have low but non-trivial accuracy and uses them somehow to obtain a hypothesis that has higher accuracy. So the usual setup is that we have a weak learner. So this is an algorithm that achieves low accuracy but works under any distribution. So a boosting algorithm runs a weak learner as a black box on many different distributions. These distributions are adapt adaptively constructed. And at the end, it combines the outputs of all these weak learners into a final hypothesis. So boosting was introduced by Shapira in his thesis uh, in, uh, I think, 1990, and has become uh, one of the most studied areas in machine learning, uh, not only theory, but practice as well. And uh, you know, there has been a lot of work on boosting. I cannot uh, summarize it here. We understand it very well in the realizable case, even in the presence of noise, uh, you know, their algorithms in particular for the case of random classification noise, there's a very nice uh, uh, methodology by Kalai and Silvidio. For the case of agnostic noise, there are various papers. Uh, but in the case of Massar noise, there has been no progress. Um, so uh, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Russell Palazzo, Daniel Kane, uh, 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 Lex, uh, Rex Lay, Jessica Sorel, and Christos Zamo. So um, Lay and Sorel are students at uh, San Diego. So we recently gave the first boosting algorithm for distribution independent Massar learning. So the algorithm, perhaps unsurprisingly, it, uh, it's stuck at eta plus epsilon. So it takes any weak learner with any non-trivial guarantee and it boosts in polynomial time to uh, a learner with error eta plus epsilon, where again, eta is the upper bound on the Massar noise ratio. So basically this matches the guarantee of uh, the algorithm for hash spaces we had before. And interestingly, this eta is, uh, is um, a, a lower bound for black box boosting algorithms. So we have a, a construction like that. I think at this point, this completes the first part of the talk on distribution free uh, learning. So if there are any uh, questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to distribution specific setting. All right, so we're ready to move to the second part of the talk. So this is uh, distribution specific learning. Uh, so, so far we have seen that we can efficiently obtain some non-trivial guarantees, but certainly not optimal error uh, guarantees for Massar learning in the distribution free setting. Uh, so this motivates looking into uh, broad, but not arbitrary distributions of the examples and see what's possible there. Okay, so we want to be able to say something for structured distributions that is probably better than what we can say for arbitrary distributions. So this is the distribution specific uh, setting. So the goal in this setting is to obtain error uh, opt plus epsilon, one times opt plus epsilon with respect to the labels. Let me note here very quickly that if you want to achieve this error of opt plus epsilon in the agnostic model, even under specific distributions, let's say even under the Gaussian distribution, this is something that requires time due to the poly one over epsilon, okay? So basically to get an improvement over what is possible in the, uh, in the agnostic model, we need to do better than this. And in particular, we're going to sort of insist on algorithms that are fully polynomial, that have running time that's polynomial in both D and one over epsilon. All right, now in the Massar model in particular, having an algorithm that gives you error op plus epsilon with respect to the labels is basically equivalent to approximating the true classifier that you started from the base optimal classifier to any desired accuracy, okay? And this is gonna be the guarantee, the goal we want to achieve now. We want to find an H such that the error of H and F, where F is a true function goes to zero, okay? It, it, it goes arbitrarily close to zero. And note that this type of equivalence between O plus epsilon misclassification error and uh, epsilon uh, error with respect to the true function is only true in this Massar model. In the agnostic model, it's not possible to actually approximate the optimum to arbitrarily small error. All right, now, uh, I guess this equivalence is a simple calculation in the Massar model. Uh, all right, 
Uh, now, in the distribution specific setting, there are several polynomial time algorithms in the literature developed um, since uh, um, like 2015 in uh, papers by uh, Wast, Balkan, and collaborators. So, in particular, we, we did know a polynomial time algorithm when the distribution was uniform over the sphere, so very well behaved. I mean, these things could easily be modified for the Gaussian distribution, but then if we generalize the distribution a little bit, for example, we consider the same problem over the broader class of local TF distribution. So we don't know the exact distribution anymore, but we know the family where it belongs. Then the algorithm that was produced by this group was a little bit unsatisfactory in the sense that uh, its dependence in uh, the, this parameter one minus two eta, which sort of the gap of eta from a half was very bad. It was like doubly exponential, right? So, uh, so the question is, okay, can we get a polynomial time algorithm for this more general class of local concave distributions or more ambitiously for broader families of structured distributions? Uh, so in recent work with Christos and our students, Vasilis Kondonis and uh, Nikos Arifis, we made some progress in this direction. So specifically, we have identified the family of distributions uh, that we term well-behaved for which an efficient learning algorithm with optimal error, okay, so it uh, is, uh, is actually possible. So I'm not going to formally define what well-behaved distribution means here, but roughly speaking, the property that we need is that uh, uh, if we take uh, a two-dimensional, any two-dimensional projection of the data, then it will have good anti-concentration and satisfy reasonable tail bounds. In particular, these properties that we need are actually satisfied for uh, uh, for local care distributions and very generalization with heavier tails. So as an immediate corollary, uh, we actually get an efficient algorithm for distributions as well. And let me also know that the concurrent work by Zhang, uh, Shen and Awasti obtained a different polynomial time algorithm for this special case of the local care distributions. All right, so that's a theorem. So I'm gonna give you uh, a few minutes of description of how this algorithm works before I move on to stronger models. Uh, okay, so some intuition about this version of the problem. So now we have distributional assumptions. So the question is, how can we actually use them to do better than in the distribution free case? So let's remember what we want to solve. So what we want to minimize is the population risk. So this expectation of the step function of minus y w dot x. Uh, so we suffer loss of one if y and the inner product of w dot x have different signs and loss of zero otherwise. Of course, you know, this is not something we can uh, get our hands on and actually solve, it's highly non-convex. So let's again, try to see what we can do with convex surrogates with convex relaxations. So let's take the step function and try to replace it by a convex function G. Uh, we had seen earlier that this is something that really fails in the distribution independent setting. In fact, it also fails in the distribution specific setting. So even for um, uh, Gaussian data, you cannot use convex surrogates to get um, uh, to get near optimal error. So our idea, okay, is to replace this uh, zero one step function by a non-convex function. That's going to be a smooth approximation to to um, to the zero one function to the step function. In particular, uh, so this type of logistic loss here is one possibility. We can use many other things. So let me give you a picture. So this is a step function. And this smooth approximation is this logistic loss. So this function has a parameter sigma, which basically quantifies how close this logistic loss is to the step function. Uh, so uh, ideally, sort of, if sigma is not too small, like if you solve this sort of non-convex problem, then this would be good enough. But of course, it's not clear to have made any progress here because uh, like there is no reason to believe a priori that uh, replacing the zero one function by some non-convex relaxation is better than the initial non-convex problem, which is actually exact. So algorithmically wise is useful. In particular, it's, uh, can we even approximate the global optimum of this new objective? And uh, uh, the answer to that is that we don't really need to approximate the global optimum. Uh, in particular, the main structural uh, lemma that one can show is that uh, any points that has small gradient is good enough for the purposes of our learning problem. So they have this lemma, I'm not gonna uh, read out loud. So more formally, like if the parameter sigma is sufficiently small, we take any weight vector W, which is the normal vector to the um, uh, unknown half space, 
that has non-trivial angle from the optimal one, that this point W needs to have a large gradient with respect to this uh, function. So assuming that this structural lemma is true, uh, we, as a corollary, we get an algorithmic result. In particular, we can use any first order method that converges to stationarity uh, and get uh, you know, an efficient algorithm for our learning problem. In particular, you can just use SGD projected, I guess. So this is the algorithm. So run SGD on this non-convex objective. So really the difficulty is showing that uh, this suffices, in particular proving this structural lemma. So let me give you an idea of uh, how we actually do this. So, uh, so for simplicity, we're gonna look at a two-dimensional version of the problem. It turns out that uh, this is without loss of generality. We can always do that. And uh, to make things even easier, I'm going to assume that the distribution on the domain is the uniform distribution on the sphere. So here is the picture. So what do we have here? We have uh, the green half space, which is the optimal half space, W star. This is what we're looking for. And uh, we also have this black vector W, which is a candidate half space that we assume has large angle from W star. And what we want to show is that W will, will have a large gradient, okay? Uh, so, so one observation here is that since we're optimizing over the unit sphere, if we look at these gradients, uh, they're not gonna have um, any radial component. So the radial component is gonna be zero. Uh, sorry, it's gonna be, it's gonna be um, a vector perpendicular to W, okay? So the goal is to show that this vector is non-zero, okay, if the, if the angle is large. And um, a, sort of an intuition here is that when we run SGD, we draw a sample from the uniform distribution of the sphere, and then we update um, according to the gradient of that point X, uh, so if you do the calculation, you'll see that there are two kinds of points in this, uh, uh, in this problem. So there are these blue points, and these are points that, whose gradients uh, actually point to the right direction. They point left. So this is the direction of the optimal half space. So these are the good points. So these are the points that help us uh, prove our lemma. And we also have these red points that point in the opposite direction. So these are points whose gradients point away from the optimal half space. Now, since the distribution is uniform, it might look like, uh, you know, since the area of this blue region is much larger than the area of the uh, uh, red region, uh, we're good, right? So we're done. So uh, unfortunately, this is not true. So it turns out that um, the noise decreases the contribution of the blue region by a factor that goes to zero as eta goes to half. So a factor is gonna be something like one minus two eta. So eta is the upper bound on the noise rate. So it could be the case that uh, the gradient contributions of the blue region and the red region cancel out and the lemma is false. So the way we fix this is by using this parameter sigma that quantifies the approximation between this logistic loss and uh, the zero one step function. So this is the, uh, the basic parameter of our non-convex targets. And uh, so when we pick sigma to be small enough, you know, hopefully not too small because this affects the complexity of the problem, so what we are doing, we're essentially reweighting the samples so that only samples that are at distance roughly sigma from the current half space, so the half space defined by W, which is the current point, will have no trivial contribution to the gradient. So the picture looks something like that uh, when we have this sigma parameter. Now observe that in this case, the ratio of the blue region and the red region uh, are restricted to this slab increases as sigma decreases. So for small enough sigma, the blue region will have much larger contribution than the red region. And therefore the gradient of W will be, the gradient of W will be large. So overall, by picking this parameter sigma to be sufficiently small, uh, as the lemma says, we can rule out any hypothesis which has large angle to be an approximate stationary point. And th that basically is um, you know, the entire proof. Are there any questions about the proof of this lemma? If not, uh, I'll move on to the next topic. All right, so in the past, uh, in, in the last, uh, let's say maybe five, 10 minutes, uh, I will give you a flavor of how to go a step further. So really the question is, um, are there even more challenging benign noise models, so more challenging than Massar, for which we can get efficient algorithms in the distribution specific setting? So recall that the Massar model assumes that these probabilities, the flipping probabilities are uniformly bounded by a parameter eta, 
which is technically less than half. So unfortunately, this assumption of bounded noise fails to capture a number of uh, uh, sort of realistic noise sources that, uh, that are uh, important in practice. For example, this includes uh, the case where the data is annotated by humans. So this is called human annotation noise. So, and you know, there are many other settings, for example, when the noise uh, rate becomes larger when you're close to the separating hyperplane or when um, maybe the, the sort of classification is close to random in areas where the density is very small. So there is a stronger noise model in the literature that allows the, these flipping probabilities to be arbitrarily close to half. Uh, and this call, it's called Tsibakov noise model. Here is the definition. So it says that uh, if you take a point X, then the probability that the noise function at X is bigger than half minus T, T is some parameter, grows as some function of T to the alpha. This parameter alpha is basically uh, sort of, as it goes to zero, the model becomes more um, uh, challenging. All right, so this Tsibakov noise model has been very popular in the learning theory community, uh, especially with statisticians, has been extensively studied in the past uh, two decades. So the motivation for starting from sort of an algorithmic perspective is because it actually provides a unifying framework to capture this situation that I uh, just mentioned, where sort of the noise is not bounded uh, uniformly from above. Now, in terms of sample complexity, the model is fairly well understood. Okay, so polynomial many samples suffice for most concept classes that we care about. But the algorithmic question is much harder in high dimensions, in particular until like recently, there was no non-trivial algorithm, even under the Gaussian distribution uh, on data. Uh, so in very recent work with the same co-authors with uh, Condonis and uh, Zarifis, so we're able to give a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for optimally learning half space in this model. So the algorithm recovers the optimal half space within error epsilon and runs in time that is quasi-polynomial in epsilon, like d to the log square one over epsilon. So this is the first improvement over agnostic learning uh, for this problem. Now, let me briefly explain uh, why learning in this model is more challenging compared to, uh, compared to the Massal model. So at a high level, the idea or the difficulty, I guess, is the following. So recall that this previous algorithm for Massal noise we described um, restricted its attention to a small band around the candidate hypothesis W. And we looked at the intersection of this band and the disagreement region between, let's say, the candidate half space and the optimal half space. Now, if we do the same thing with the Tsibakov noise, then it is quite possible that all the points in this region have probabilities, like flipping probabilities, very close to half, just by the definition of the model. As a result, the useful signal that these points provide may not be strong enough to overcome the effect of the remaining points. So basically these uh, techniques inherently fail uh, in this model. So how do, overcome, how do we overcome this obstacle? So I'm gonna give you a sort of very high level description of what we do. So we're gonna look at an easier problem. So I'm gonna give you a candidate W, a candidate weight vector. I'm gonna ask you to certify if it's far from the optimal half space W star. And uh, the idea is that um, sort of we can view such a certificate as a non-negative reweighting uh, of the points. So in particular, we have the following simple fact. So the proof is a simple calculation. So it says that if um, a weight vector W is far from W star, it means it has large angle, then there exists a non-negative function T t of x, such that this expectation of t of x times y w dot x is actually negative. Uh, and of course, now this should be straightforward if you think about it for a minute, because you can just take t of x to be the disagreement region between w and w star, right? Um, like on the other hand, if you take w to be the optimal half space, w to be equal to w star, then this expectation is not negative for any non-negative function t. So in reality, this means that in order to certify non-optimality of a weight vector W, it is enough to find such a non-negative function T, okay, that makes this expectation negative. And when we have 
such an algorithm to find such a function t, then we can actually use it essentially in a black box manner to approximate the optimal half space. So we can reduce the learning problem to this easier certification problem. Now, the way that this deduction works, it could be either sort of viewing this type of, uh, this type of certifying algorithm as a separation oracle, or by using online convex optimization, you can pick and choose. So really the difficulty is to find a function of this form, okay? Uh, like you, can, you cannot just use T of X to be the disagreement region between W and W star. This is intractable uh, to actually find. So, uh, so here's a lemma that appears in this paper. So it says that in order to certify non-optimality, uh, and again, this is for the distribution specific setting. So it, uh, it explicitly leverages properties of the underlying distribution. And then it, it suffices to consider these reweighting functions T of X that are not arbitrary, but they have a very specific form. In particular, essentially, they're gonna be of the form square of a low degree polynomial times um, the sort of the characteristic function of, uh, of a band close to W. So this is gonna be a function T of X. So the, uh, this, this lemma tells us that uh, there exists a polynomial of low degree of degree something like logarithmic in one over epsilon such that such a certificate actually exists. And in fact, we can compute it in time that, is, um, uh, that scales as D to the K. And so there are two parts in proving this. So part one is to show that such a polynomial exists. And this is something we can do using uh, uh, Jebison polynomials. And uh, algorithmically, uh, we can find it using SDP, okay? We can solve a semi-definite program to check this condition over all squares of polynomials of degree at most K, all right? So overall, this leads to a quasi-polynomial time algorithm for this problem. So the obvious question is whether a polynomial time algorithm exists. And the answer is yes. So. So this is in a very recent paper with the same authors plus uh, Daniel Kane. Now to achieve this, to, to get a polynomial time algorithm, we use the same overall framework, the same certificate based, uh, based framework, but we need a much more sophisticated algorithm to find uh, such a certificate. All right, so this concludes the technical part of the talk. So let me uh, summarize. So. So what did we do today? So I described um, uh, a line of work, a recent line of work that um, sort of, in my opinion, is sort of a, a first sort of step in restarting this field of like learning with sort of benign um, uh, models of noise. So it's a part of a broader effort to develop a general theory of robust learning in high dimensions. Uh, so basically the uh, sort of conceptual points is that it is possible to get some non-trivial error guarantee for natural classes of functions in the distribution independent setting uh, in the presence of benign noise, but unfortunately there's still some limitations. And uh, if we make assumptions about the underlying distribution, we can actually get optimal learning algorithms, right? So in terms of future directions, I mean, there are many, I mean, there, some of them are obvious. Uh, for example, you know, we mostly talked about half spaces in this talk. So what happens for more general classes of functions? I mean, the two obvious, Generalizations here would be low degree polynomial threshold functions and intersections of half spaces. Uh, a conceptual question is whether there are other natural uh, models of noise, so semi random uh, noise models, in which we can learn efficiently uh, either in the distribution free setting or under weak assumptions about the distribution. Uh, in terms of Heisen results, see, this is like your cup of tea. So the only evidence we have so far for hardness of these problems are in the statistical query model. So if you come from path learning, uh, as I do, uh, this is a sort of satisfactory uh, answer. Uh, if you want reductions, then it would be an interesting question to, to see, for example, can we actually obtain reductions from some problems that are believed to be hard in the average case? Or maybe can we prove uh, some of squares learn bounds? All these things uh, should be doable. We have some ideas in these directions. And from a practical standpoint, it would be nice if these types of new algorithms could have some practical applications, for example, in data poisoning. Uh, so for those types of applications, I do not expect any end-to-end -end guarantees, any theorems, but maybe some of the insights of these algorithms can be used to, per to, to sort of uh, improve practical performance. Uh, all right, so at this point, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, 
I'm done and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions for Elias? I guess I have a question. I mean, you sort of touched on this at the end, but maybe you could speculate on um, if, if there's some natural relaxation of the independence assumption on, for these noise models. Right, right. So, so I mean, uh, one can relax independence a little bit, but um, we do not know exactly to what degree. In particular, like one way to view the Massal model, like which is not exactly equivalent, is that you have an adversary that has full control on a random, a uniformly random eta subset of the data, eta fraction of the data. Okay, so this is not sort of an independent setting. Right, right. And uh, all algorithms that have been developed work in this uh, slightly stronger setting as well. Now, to what extent we can we can actually uh, relax independence is unclear. So this is an interesting direction for future work. So in reality, there is a continuum of semi-random models that interpolate between a random classification noise and agnostic, and really we don't know what the answer is for most of them. So what I gave you today is like really a snapshot of uh, what we can do for two specific models and for specific classes of functions. Got it. Um... Great. Um, also, Ilias, maybe if, I don't know if you're planning on making your slides available, but when you kind of briefly went through uh, the Massard noise and you said, oh, you know, these lemmas are, fit on one slide, you know, people might be interested in, in looking at those slides because yeah, you just is, flashed, yeah, flashed by is, them. Yeah, yeah, this is why, this is why the slides are in. So I did give a talk somewhere, let me remember. Okay, at CMU, um, I think this might, this might be online. We actually present this proof but this was like a one hour talk that uh, focused only on the first part of this, um, uh, of this talk. But okay. in any case, yeah, in any case, these slides are gonna be, you know, in, that's why they're in there. They're gonna be in my, uh, you know, in the slides that I send. And um, um, in fact, the, slide, the proof in these slides is complete. It's like so slightly si simpler than what is in the initial paper. Great, great. Okay, well, thanks again, Ilias, for, um, you know, wrapping up the whole workshop here uh, on a high note. And uh, thanks to all the speakers and contributors. Uh, it was an exciting week, and I uh, hope to see everybody in person at some point at the Simons Institute uh, in, a, in, a, in the near future. Thank you. Bye.